kind of getting the introduction to 3D models and 3D printing. Today, we're mostly just going to be covering the basics of 3D printing, understanding where we can find 3D models, because if we're going to do printing, we have to have some fix on the model to actually print. Um, we'll be going over things about filaments, and then, of course, how to use 3D printers, which gets into slicing and printing of the models that you find. And we'll talk about some other printer technologies, and most importantly, how we become good Make Haven members when we're 3D printing. So, basics of 3D printing. So, um, basically, it's just getting a plastic in a liquid state and then turning it into a solid state. And there are a lot of different techniques that we use to get that to occur. Um, you can see here, of course, Benchy, the benchmark test, um, is used from a lot of different printers. You can see that incredibly giant one in the lower left-hand corner. But um, it, it's a really good print because, again, it has a lot of the challenging things that come in with 3D printing. And it's a good model if you want to see if something is wrong with the printer when you're setting it up. Let's see. So. That's incredibly strange. There we go. So, um, so as you can see, we've crossed out the making a new design, but technically, Technically, when you're 3D printing, the first thing you're going to want to do is have a design or a model. In this case, we're jumping to step two, where we would have the geometry data in STL format. And that is what essentially we use to tell the 3D printer what to make. It's basically the geometric data of the actual model that you have. And we'll go over some uh, file type, uh, specific things about file types we should know. But then step three, we slice the design. All 3D printers understand 3D models as different slices of the object going up through the form, defining each layer. Because all 3D printers, for the most part, operate under the presumption that they're going to make the object one layer at a time. The finer the layer, the more accurate the print is. Uh, and obviously, if you have thicker layers, the less accurate it becomes. Different printers also have different effects in terms of what they look like when they're done. And then, of course, once we've done our slicing after getting our geometry, step four, we just go ahead and 3D print that thing. And we have somebody to lend it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is me. <laughs> oh, my God. So the two most common types of 3D printers are FDM or FFF printers. And you know, I'm going to do want to move that out of here so people in the room maybe can see that better. I really hate Zoom. Can you click and drag on your screen sharing? There it is. I really hate that thing. Anyway, um, so two of us type 3D printing, FDM or FFF. So FDM, pretty straightforward, fused deposition modeling, also called FFF for fused filament fabrication. It's basically, um, you can see, I love that little orange um, note right there. It's basically like a hot glue gun. It's a CNC controlled hot glue gun, but instead of hot glue, it's warming up a thermoplastic from a spool of plastic. It's melting it into a liquid in order to make it even thinner and actually put it on as a layer of plastic, one layer at a time. In essence, in an FDM print, it's almost like it's kind of spiraling up the model as it goes, creating each layer as it adds more. Now, of course, there are many different types of FDM printers, many different types of specialized filaments or different particular types of materials for different purposes. And FDM printers are quite versatile. Um, also, their prints are incredibly robust. What's great about them is that it, as it heats up each layer, each layer becomes bonded to the layer below it, meaning that it has a really strong bond. And actually, what's nice about it is, especially if you pay attention to print direction, you can create very, very strong uh, parts for your prototypes. SLA printing stands for stereolithography. And this is what's kind of, oh, sorry. Yeah. Gems, is that? Uh, uh, this is foundations. Gems is going to be downstairs. Very good. Uh, that might explain. Uh, <laughs> So SLA stands for stereo lithography, which all what's also weird that I mentioned the file type STL that also stands for stereo lithography. So nobody can seem to agree upon what the abbreviation of stereo lithography is. But um, basically all it means is um, is that each layer is cured through a laser-driven process. Um, sometimes it'll be um, 
actually melting a material in place. Or a lot of times you can see in the example here, it's actually um, a UV curing resin that's flash hardened by a laser as it scans the surface. Um, what's really cool about SLA printing is that you can even see from the example picture, very, very high quality prints. The surface finish is fantastic. Disadvantages, you have to have a liquid and a vessel, you have to have clean equipment, it's very messy. And what's also tough is that the liquid plastic can sometimes just go bad on you. And uh, they tend to be a little bit more difficult to take care of, but their strength properties are very similar to FDM printing. So typically, especially here at Maypaven, larger parts or functional parts are typically made in an FDM process. SLA is better for smaller, more artistic detail pieces, although that's not a hard and fast rule. I'll do it again. So the hot end of an FDM or FFF printer, um, what you, as you can see here from this example, plastic basically goes um, through a collet um, into a bushing, goes right through an extruder, and then it, there's actually a heater block at the bottom. So remember, everything above that little hot end there is relatively cool, but that hot end is very hot, especially when it's printing or going through its heating cycle. So you want to stay away from that thing, especially when it's in operation. Now, that's also a very sensitive part of the 3D printer because it's essentially having molten plastic shoved into it, extruded out, and it's also scraping over the printing surface. So that means they're prone to wearing out, getting damaged, cracking, and also sometimes the, uh, the actual parts that hold them in place can become damaged and that can lead to bad parts. Uh, but it's always important to realize that, you know, you have that important nozzle right there. So pay attention to that. And a lot of times if you're having trouble with the print, or maybe it's looking a little gloppy or looking a little messy, chances are the hot end could be gummed, gummed up with extra plastic, or in certain instances, maybe damaged. Um, a lot of us 3D printer guys do a pretty good job paying attention to <laughs> what it looks like under there. Um, and the systems are designed to help maintain those hot ends as well. So. The thing is, especially early on, 3D printing was called rapid prototyping. But they stopped calling it that because it takes so long. It takes a very long time to print stuff. And that's because, again, it's building it up layer by layer by layer. But what's nice in this, what I think is a really good point they bring up in the right-hand corner there of this slide, is that you don't really have to babysit the 3D printer, especially if you uh, modeled it very confidently, you've set it up well, and um, you've paid attention to setting the machine up properly. It's kind of just a plug and play, walk away, get it to its job kind of thing. Um, so let's get into where we find the stuff we're going to print. So this is before we're going to get into like how we actually model this stuff. But um, basically, there are a lot of resources for 3D models online. Uh, two very popular ones are Printables by Prusa. That's the same company that actually makes the 3D printers, the FDM printers we use downstairs. And, and Thingiverse, which uh, actually makes MakerBot. Um, both of them have all different types of models from kind of just cool art projects, tools, useful things around the home, to you can even see right there on the uh, Printables by Prusa side, like miniatures and stuff that people make. I mean, there's a lot of great artists and designers making really cool things and publishing those designs online. A lot of times they're free. Sometimes you have to pay to buy them. Uh, for instance, I know there's uh, another site, Colts 3D is another one where there's a lot of 3D stuff. Basically, if you search anything in Google plus, you know, 3D model or STL, you'll find a million different sites that actually have a lot of different uh, models for you to download and print. Uh, and in fact, even a lot of websites that provide uh, 3D models always provide formats that will allow you to print them or use them for other purposes after you've paid a fee. That's kind of the difference. There are free places online and paid places. These two are better because it's all freeware. You can kind of download it offline. You don't worry about it. it's going to cost you anything. So printing in place. This is kind of a really cool thing you can do with 3D printers. Uh, another fun little fact, the uh, little wrench there is another type of benchmark print that was really popular with Stratasys machines back in the day. Um, these are really awesome things that 3D printers can do because since it's building everything in one spot, a 3D printer can sort of understand when there's a gap between two objects. 
and actually allow that space to exist during the manufacturing process, leading to a print that once it's removed from the print bed is posable or movable or dynamic in some way. And you can see with all these objects that have been printed, they were all printed in place as one object, taken off the print bed, cleaned up, and can actually be completely movable and usable. So everything from the wrench I mentioned to the, the parallel pliers just below them down to the cool posable animals like the gecko and the octopus that you can see. Uh, you can see how the octopus would look kind of coming out of the machine up on the upper left and just one column over, you can see a bunch of them printed in different colors just kind of flopped around. Those are, uh, that's a great example of joints being used in printed place. Um, just below the second picture of the, all the octopuses, you can also see um, a design that seems to use um, living hinges as well, or printed place hinges, where it's either a simple pin hinge that's been printed in place that can be easily moved, or um, it's an actual living hinge where the material hasn't been thin enough where it can flex. Um, and actually, if you look next to it, the spoon catapult it actually uses a living hinge to create tension to launch. You can see how that member there, this one's it's straight, that one's bent, so they're using elasticity of the plastic to create the energy to move it. But you can see how 3D printers can also be used to create really complex gear meshings, like the kind of like a helical planetary gear just below the first octopus and above the wrench. It's a pretty dynamic thing that would actually be very challenging to make with traditional methods, but with 3D printing, we can actually make something. Um, in fact, if you look up an image of what's called the brain gear. That's another very, very famous 3D printing uh, uh, model. It's like, I think it's technically a component of like oil drilling equipment, but it's like a hyper complicated gear that can be made very easily with 3D printing. Um, so next, there are some other really cool things you can do with 3D printing. These are two kind of like inspiration examples. The first one, lithophanes. Um, this is actually pretty neat because it's something that just looks like a textured print, but then once light is shown through it, it actually creates an image. Um, I don't know if this will make sense to anybody, but when Star Wars Attack of the Clones came out, one of like the little like three prize cereal box things you can get was like a little plastic like screen cap thing that used the exact same technology. So, you know, close to 20 years later, you've got websites and services that will make it for you. <laughs> so that's kind of a cool, I mean, I, I was kind of thinking about that. Um, but uh, and we have, I think we have uh, somebody made a comment real quick. Posted a picture, oh, posted a picture of a brain gear. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, they are pretty neat. Basically, like early on, every single person wanted a 3D printer had one of those on their desk. Um, and what's really cool are the generative designs right here. So what's cool about this? These are for making oops, plastic. These are for making um, print in place, very dynamic models that you can see here from these examples change shape or behave like cloth. Um, and this is kind of cool because it's sort of a faster way because essentially what this company has done is they've taken a little bit of that difficulty of designing all those finite elements and have found a way to streamline it where you can actually create these and learn about how they work. So that's a pretty awesome uh, tool to have at your disposal. Also good to know. Um, I've even seen people do, uh, actually uh, Darcy just the other day printed a 3D printed chain for a big necklace he was making. Um, I've even seen people do 3D printed chain mail all kinds of cool things with print in place, dynamic models. So again, we're gonna go over the quickly, just a few file types that are incredibly important. STL is the, with a big capital T-H-E, file type that our 3D printers need to have in order to produce a model. Um, obviously, every single modeling program will have like a proprietary file format and a bunch of other types of file formats that are incredibly helpful to have. Um, but STL, like I said, is the other abbreviation of stereolithography. Again, it's all the geometric data of a model. So for instance, if you're using a software that has really cool manipulation tools or cool historical updating features, an STL doesn't save any of that. It doesn't even save color data. It's literally just the actual shapes of everything. Um, Step is slightly more sophisticated. Step is also a very popular transfer format between different 3D modeling tools. 
Um, it does hold more data than STL. In my experience, it will recognize separate bodies more easily if you open it in a program. Like STL does support multi bodies, but it's just kind of like it's two bodies next to each other. You can't really do much with it. So, for instance, you can have one file that contains two separate bodies. So, for instance, in the previous examples of these dynamic models, models that can move, they're technically one file, but they contain multiple separate bodies. So, it's what's called a multi body part in the in modeling parlance. And steps will still support those. Technically, STL does, but it, they're not easy to edit. Step will kind of retain some of that editing language, but not all of it. Like the different parts in the step, I guess. Yeah, it, it will recognize that. And even, uh, I've saved stuff for instance, like SolidWorks a lot. I've saved steps out of SolidWorks and then open them up in another license of SolidWorks. It will recognize that information and turn it back into the assembly. But you know, it, it kind of hit or miss, I find, with steps. But they are an excellent transfer format. Another great transfer format, which isn't listed here, IGES, dot IGES. Really, really good transfer format. It tends to be a little bit uh, smaller file type than STL or step, so it's really good for passing stuff between people. Um, 3MF, that is the Prusa save file. So it basically is going to be something that 3D printers understand, G code will be stored in there. Um, dot obj is another type of geometry file format dot obj is typically an export format for a lot of more artistic 3d modeling programs your maya your zbrush they're going to almost exclusively export an obj although a lot of them over the years have moved on to stl and step as something they'll export also to note um, you'll notice kind of this interesting sphere made of different polygons it is also important that sometimes different 3D printing environments don't play nice with each other. So sometimes you transfer something over, for instance, maybe this was at one time a perfect sphere, but then you open it in Maya and it's like trying to interpret it as polygons or nerve surfaces and it kind of screws it up and tends to make errors and stuff in its interpretation. It doesn't always happen, but you want to just be aware that it can sometimes. And over time, depending on what tools you use, you'll learn really good techniques to fix them. So, any quick questions about file types, anything like that we've covered so far? Anybody have questions online? Doesn't look like it. Nope. Cool. I'm going to pause a second just in case a message comes through. Okay. No. All right. So filament and storage. So this is really important, um, especially around here, because we are sharing the tools and the resources. So um, PLA, polylactic acid, is a really cool, it's actually a bioplastic, it's corn-based, um, so it is more environmentally friendly than something like ABS, it's just quite a bit weaker than ABS, but it's still a really, really good material. Um, for common settings of the nozzle, you can see there, it's actually really important for creating successful prints. You always want to make sure the nozzle's at 215 and the bed's around 60. 3D printers will tell you the nozzle and bed temperature so that you can understand if there's a problem or if you have been, if, you're, if you set everything correctly for your print. Um, the filament, like all the filaments here, are best stored in a dry box. Humidity can tend to uh, degrade these filaments over time. So you want to store them in a nice, cool, dry place. Um, which So that's kind of sort of good for in a basement because at least it's dry or cool-ish, but not necessarily dry-ish. So we have to pay attention to that. Um, and um, it is also interesting where if it gets too humid, that means you'll get poor print quality. Um, that'll create uh, distortions in your models and will lead to not good results if it's too damp. Uh, even if the filament is damaged, that can also lead to some issues in printing. But for the most part, keep it on a spool, keep it in a nice cool, dry place. The filament can last quite a while. Just be aware, old filament may not work as well as fresh filament. And that could be one of the reasons why the, the uh, humidity of work is stored. So uh, Makehaven has PLA. And basically, all the PLA that's essentially not labeled as somebody's personal filament um, is available for you to use for any of the print jobs you have going. It's almost always PLA, usually in a lot of standard colors. There tends to be a lot of blacks and grays. I think I've seen a couple of white and light grays too. But typically, downstairs, you'll find fairly neutral colors. If you want something really exotic, you'll have to purchase your own filament. 
Here at Make Haven, it's really cheap. It's a really good rate per meter here, 10 cents a meter. Can't beat that, even a lot of online suppliers can't match that. Um, and you can use your own filament. Just remember you clearly label on the school whose filament it is, maybe a contact number just in case something goes wrong with the print. Um, it's always good to make sure um, in that instance, maybe have some contact information on the school in case somebody finds it or falls off or something happens. Uh, Especially if it's an expensive filament, you're going to want to make sure it doesn't disappear or something like that. Don't use any filament that somebody else has labeled as theirs. Just a common courtesy. You wouldn't want somebody stealing your wood or your metal in either of the shops downstairs. So be courteous. Make sure you don't take people's stuff. Um, make sure that when your prints are done and you've used your own filament to promptly remove it from the printer to allow somebody else to use their own filament or the make it filament. Um, you know, again, if you're obviously printing a model, it might take like 28 hours or something to print. And, you know, maybe if you're going to be at work or something, you can't get to it that day. Like, you know, either get there as soon as you can or maybe contact a good friend at Make Haven to kind of remove it or take it out for you. Just so we can make sure the 3D printers can keep up and running with people who want to use them. Um, the foundation shelf is fine for storage. Your personal storage is always... 100% great <laughs> because that keeps it out of the way and you know it's safe. Um, other things to know about PLA. Um, so PLA is going to be what we use. There are other types of filaments. Like I mentioned ABS. I mean, it's basically the plastic that you know, everything's made out of. It's incredibly strong, incredibly versatile, but will not work on the printers downstairs. Um, I don't think any of the printers we have actually get hot enough to melt it. Um, and with ABS, you have to have certain conditions for it to print properly. So don't buy spools of ABS. You will be upset. So let's try to stick to PLA. But there are, uh, for instance, there can be different colors, different color effects of PLA. And even uh, you can even have like uh, metal reinforced or like metal sparkle types of filaments and stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff to find out there. So, yes. So if we're going to use um, the Make Haven filament. How do we know how much filament we need for our project? That's a fantastic uh, question. It actually comes up when we do the slicing phase okay. of our project. So good lead-in question. Good lead-in question. And nope, nobody's asking. So slicing. So basically to go a little bit over the process, um, simplified there at the bottom, which I think is pretty good. There's a model saved out as an STL that becomes G-code. That's long and short of this entire process. But you have uh, your 3D model, you've exported an STL, and then an interstitial program called a slicer has to process that three-dimensional data. And what it does is exactly what's on the tin. It slices that model into a bunch of different layers, uh, usually based on the settings of the printer you have, because obviously a slicer for one printer may, may like code it in such a way where the printer doesn't understand it or it's not set to the right height or, or the right Z height settings or filament settings. But generally it'll slice it into all the different layers. It'll allow you to preview those different layers. It'll allow you to add support material, which we'll also talk about. And most importantly, it exports all that information into G code, which stands for geometry code, which is you know, really difficult there. And that code is what tells the a motor controller in the 3D printer, like what to do, where to be, how to get from point A to point B, how to create the three-dimensional model in plastic. Then, of course, once it's all done, you've got your 3D printed part, pop it off, remove support material, and you're on your way. So here we are with the Prusa slicer. Uh, this is the one we use downstairs. It's calibrated to work with 3D printers that you have. Um, because they're Prusa 3D printers, so the slicer just is a beautiful match for them. You can set, you can see here how it's showing the actual uh, work plate of a Prusa 3D printer. And that's actually how you get started when you're setting up a model. You pick which version of 3D printer you have. And usually it already has the automatic fill of like all the particular temperature and filament requirements there. Um, and it goes ahead and allows you to place it anywhere on that space. Uh, I'm sure, has anybody gone through the badging in the 3D printer or is that to be done? They will. So 
you'll get some, you know, once you watch the video and do the test and do your badging, you'll see all this stuff happen in real time. But to answer your question, Barb, that's where the length is calculated. So it'll tell you in, that's actually just the uh, coordinate stuff, but it will tell you how many meters of material was used. And that's just the hour. This just tells the time estimate. But basically everything is uh, put through the slicer, tells you the length, and then it's a bit of an honor system where it's like, okay, multiply that by 10 cents. That's how much you owe and you pay online or in the cash box next to the three printers. Um, oh, somebody's joining. There we go. So, um, Octoprint is what runs the 3D printer. It's an online-based system. So basically, uh, you can see right there, octopi1.makehaven.org. That takes you to the control interface for Octopi1. Uh, there's two, three, and four, I think it goes eight or seven. Wow, I don't know the full number of Octopi addresses there are. But basically, on each 3D printer, there is an Octopi, then a numeral for the name of each printer. And when you visit that Octopi, that number at makehaven.org, it takes you to the control of each specific printer. Again, it's printed on each 3D printer. It's a label with it. I think it's about Octopi. I know, like, exactly. And then, well, because isn't like, aren't like two small ones, like six and seven or something? Yeah. But then it moves one and two, six, seven. I don't it know. isn't necessarily <laughs> in order. Doesn't make sense. One of the many mysteries of making. So there are other slicer programs um, and other control programs. Octopi is what we use. Um, again, Octopi will allow you to see what's printing. It's basically what collects the G code that's been exported from the slicer, puts it in a 3D printer, and lets you know how the 3D printer's operating and keeps it in control, and also helps it process the G code. So. I assume that you have to put the slicer to print here at BG. Uh, you can't access it from, you can't access it remotely. Yeah, so Prisa Slicer, that program is a free program that you can download on your computer and you can generate a file that you can just open up on computer. So you can do that on your machine. Yeah, so or the, slicer, the Slicer can be done at home. The printing, you can't start a print unless you're on the site. Yeah, you because you, you have to, uh, yeah, you have to print it start. She is. Yeah. That's right. I'm a little um, so this is like I, when I previously used to printers and put the file directly to the computer and then start on the screen. Like in this case, but again, through Octopus. Do you do the website? Yeah, you do it through the website. And it is actually, you're doing it on the website, but you can only access the website if you're on Make Haven's local area network. So okay, you yeah. should be physically present just so people can start prints from home. And by the way, I was now in what the printer is actually doing. Gotcha. Um, so what's cool is kind of a little interesting um, addendum here for exotic G code. Um, obviously, 3D printing is something that has it's constantly having research done to it and creating more dynamic and interesting ways to 3D print. What I find most interesting is actually the tiny image in the lower left corner, non-planar 3D printing. So any of you who encountered 3D printing, you know that when something pops out, it actually is kind of ridged. Non-planar 3D printing basically says, okay, what if each layer was actually coplanar with the outside of the shape you're trying to create? So instead of the printer head just blindly doing flat layers, it's doing layers sympathetic to the geometry it's producing, meaning that it's creating a smooth surface. So it, it's still, being developed, it hasn't been fully, you know, put out there yet. I've seen a lot of hobbies do some cool stuff with it. Um, but you see how with, you know, different types of G-code, you can create, like, wireframes, like this big rocket here. Even, like, woven types of interesting material, like this basket here. And even creating other different types of shapes that would be hard to create with traditional G-code. 
code systems because obviously if you put a dynamic shape like that Christmas tree to the uh, cruise slides you're going to have, it's actually going to try to slice and print each one of those little uh, spindly branches as opposed to just realizing, oh, I could just put like a string of material there and move on to that. So that's just part of interesting things you can do when you start breaking down G code and how it works. Um, infill is another important thing for the printer. So infill is essentially a way that we save time and material while also maintaining decent strength in 3D printing. So on these blue examples here, you can see where um, there's the 100% fill. That would be if your 3D printer was making it fully 100% solid plastic and filling every single layer as much as possible. In order to save time on print, save money, and save material, you use infill, which is essentially creating a repeating lattice-like structure hidden inside your print that allows it to be just as strong and just as durable while also saving a lot of time and space. Um, you can see there's a lot of like interesting fill types. Um, the kind that is used downstairs in Prusa, there's a few different presets. The standard one is called like, is it called like randomized waveform or something like that? It looks like it looks like a bunch of crossy waves. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of neat actually. Uh, but you can see there's a bunch of different types of infills. Um, that's the infill is going to be set by your slicer, um, and that's where you'll pick the percentage of infill you want and um, what type it might be. Um, I think the uh, Prusa slicer, like we said, has the wavy one, and I think it also does hex and box. So you can change that. They'll, they'll all pretty much have the same general strength properties for the most part. Um, but uh, one thing to know is that uh, around here, we will never really go on infill that's over 80. And the reason why you want to choose an infill over solid is that, believe it or not, sometimes going with a solid fill can actually lead to a less accurate print because you put on more plastic that's going to cool and increase the potential of the print curling and peeling off the base. So that's where infill can give you a bit of an advantage, especially if you're working. Um, <laughs> I've seen that before. Um, I, uh, I, I've seen that before. If you have it, I've had it so much uh, yeah. in different prints. I'm just like, oh, the infill, too much. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of like, you know, obviously in certain instances, there are printers set up to do 100% infill. There are different, like, you know, we don't have access to selective laser sintering printers, which are very different. They can do a full fill, no problem whatsoever. Even like uh, UV cure resin fillers and stuff like that. There's all kinds of different stuff you can do. For our printers, you know, don't go over eighty percent. Might have some trouble. And I think the standard uh, number is like between fifteen and twenty-five percent usually when it's uh, just automatically set, which saves you time and is pretty good because that and that's because the infill is paired with perimeters and layers. So perimeter, you have to realize when something is being printed, you can see in there the pink represents the infill layer that will be happening. The yellow represents the actual perimeter, the bounding box, the skin of your 3D print. You can specify how many layers of plastic make up that perimeter. Um, Typically, there, there is sort of like a saturation point where it doesn't really matter to make the perimeter that much thicker. Um, usually, like between, I think it's like uh, two to four layers is usually pretty good. If you're looking for something very durable, you're not going to see much of a change beyond that just because of how much infill is used. The only time you'd run into an issue is if you're making something that has a very thin wall and your perimeter, like, can kind of mess that up, make it seem really thin. Might also make the print fail anyway. So you know, we'll cover that in a sec when it comes to making sure your printers will work. But just realize um, uh, you can specify how the skin of your part is made. Again, on the Prusa, the standard the Prusa, the standard settings are usually pretty good for uh, most needs. So. Overhangs and supports. This is really important. So when your model is sliced, the slicer adds support structures. These supports are applied in very specific instances. So 
Technically, with most 3D printing technology, you can see how, with this example here, we have a Y, an H, and a T. The Y shows an example where something is overhanging, but because it's at a 45 degree angle or less, the plastic is actually able to cool and solidify in enough time for the next layer to be placed upon it and won't cause an instance where it will sag or fall off, as long as all the other conditions are meant for a successful 3D print. The H shows an example of a structure called a bridge between two support structures. Support material needs to be placed on that bridge. Why do you think? Sure. You see how on the H, yeah. there's that lighter blue representing the support material that would be placed under that center piece. So the well, there's nowhere to print on the support, right? Right. The support essentially creates a little platform for the real part to be printed. Same thing with the T, which is even going to require more support material because it has to make it all the way up to the top. In fact, if I were printing that T, I probably would have flipped it upside down. Why? No support to right. worry about. Well, we don't need support material. And I'll be saving all that plastic and all that money from not having to print that plastic. All right, so the support material is printed. Mm -hmm. It's part of the printing process, but then we just punch through it. Right. And uh, unfortunately, here at Maycaven, we don't have printers with dedicated support material, which is unfortunate um, because that saves a lot of time. But um, it will print the support material, and it makes sure that it's just enough to support the plastic and then just be easily ripped off. And what's also nice is you're in a maker space with a ton of hand tools if you need help pulling them off, which is also great. Um, you can also see um, in the upper right-hand corner, and I keep thinking when I say directions because it always looks up right and left, and I'm also looking at people while I'm talking. <laughs> You can see in the upper right hand there how what happens in overhang situations where there's no support material, where the plastic just kind of shoots down and cools off and eventually some of it builds up and it'll sort of support itself, but it completely damages the print. So it's important to make sure that support material is there and you always want to include support on your prints. But like I said, with T, there are instances where you can alter how your model is positioned to not require any support material. In fact, how would we print the Y, H, and T without the need for support material at all? Print them flat, print them lying down. Um, another important element that's added during the slicing phase are wraps, skirts, and rims. These are all techniques to improve the quality of your prints. Um, skirts are, uh, very straightforward. It's just sort of like a little bounding box line that the printer makes. It's great for making sure that the nozzle's been cleaned out. As you can imagine, especially if it's a very busy 3D printer, sometimes plastic can build up around the nozzle. And while the Prusa printer does run a purge line at the bottom of the uh, 3D printer workspace, um, sometimes it's not good enough. And when it prints the skirt, it will actually make sure that plastic is flowing and moving and pure plastic is running through that nozzle before it gets to your shape. A brim is helpful because it essentially creates a bigger platform to anchor your model to the work. And it's just a very effective way to make sure you're going to reduce warping, you're going to reduce peeling, and it improves adhesion to the work tray. Um, elephant foots are when, what, the plastic just blobs over? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I keep, I keep reading elephant foot. I'm like, okay, I'm thinking of the thing from Chernobyl or like the, all the <laughs> molten radioactive material form the child thing, but like, um, but uh, sort of one step up from a brim is a raft. So a raft is basically just like a brim, but it's actually a few layers built up. What's nice about a raft is that if, for instance, the 3D printer uh, tray you're working on is damaged or old or hasn't been adhering very well, it allows the 3D printer to essentially create a new surface that your part will sit on top of uh, to make sure it's level, to make sure it adheres properly to that surface. Because the plastic will very easily stick to itself. Um, but again, they add print time. Elephant's foot is the first layer ending up 
wider than the subsequent yeah, layer box. Oh. So Alarming out a little bit. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I've actually never had that happen. Oh no, something has gone wrong. Sean is leading this thing. Um, so. <laughs> successful. We, we need. How, do, how do we make a successful? <laughs> um, so, uh, there are a lot of things that can happen. 3D printers are both simple and complex machines. The principle behind them is very simple, and a lot of the engineering and technology is fairly straightforward. But when you have so many levers you can pull and things you can change, there's going to be issues that happen. You know, I know a lot of frequent things I have happened, uh, material running out, material getting jammed. Uh, sometimes the printer just looks like, hey, I'm not going to work today. You know, that happens. So they can be very temperamental sometimes. But these are some very common um, things that can occur uh, through printing. Like, obviously, the first two represent pretty common ones. Um, you know, just no plastic coming out or it doesn't stick to the bed. You know, you can even see in those two images, um, they've used a technique to improve bed adhesion, which is putting a layer of painter's tape down. Painter's tape, when you stick it down on the surface, the painter's tape itself has a little bit of a waxy film on top that will melt and bond to the plastic, allowing for a better, uh, better way to adhere to the work plate. At Makehaven, um, I don't think anybody does that because we mostly use glue sticks, which do the exact same thing, but also the added benefit of just being able to easily be washed off when you're done. We'll talk about that when we talk about being nice to the 3D printers. Um, but other things to note, under or over extrusion, not enough plastic, too little plastic. That can be uh, anything from the nozzle being clogged to being damaged or chipped or cracked. Uh, where it's not extruding the way the machine thinks it is. Because at the same time, while the 3D printer is advanced in knowing where the print head is, it's less sophisticated in understanding if the plastic is coming out properly in a lot of ways. So it does know it's putting plastic in. It doesn't necessarily know if it's going out properly and correctly. Um, you can also have gaps in the layers that can show that there's uh, something wrong with the settings or even like the G-code got messed up. Uh, string or oozing, overheating. I've seen layer shifting before. That can happen where there can be a glitch in a file or G code where everything gets shifted, or somehow the model moved, somebody nudged it, something happened, the plate got misaligned. Um, and, uh, you know, with a lot of these other things, you know, you can see where just general wear and tear, poor maintenance can lead to bad things happening. In fact, uh, when I was getting ready over here, here is a print that had kind of a layer separation issue. Let's see how that happens. I'll show the camera here too. This whole thing, the last couple of layers just completely fell apart. And it looks like it's looks like they tried to make like a tapered design, but the print failed and just left to this stringy better mess. Um, and that could be down to either something with the printer or it could be down to the design itself. Because like I said, 3D printers aren't 100% smart. So technically, you could model something the printer can't do. But sometimes it can't tell you it can't do that. So that's why you have to be a little smart about it and, and know where you're going sometimes. Other things to keep note of, um, though, are uh, I think on the bottom row, um, the last three are going to be something that you'll want to pay attention to quite a bit. Um, because with grinding filament, that means something's happening either the little extruding wheel, because basically a little wheel that shoves filament through the hot end. There could be a jam in there and it's just grinding away the filament or the wheel has become damaged and it's grinding away the filament and it's not pushing it in anymore. But it could also mean that there is a clogged extruder where plastic or maybe other material or impurity has caused to be jammed up and no longer able to shoot out molten plastic. And that can also lead to things stopping mid-print Plastic could run out. Something could just happen during your print. Um, if it's too humid, it's possible that if there's moisture in there and it expands quickly, it could cause a jam or even one of the other myriad of failures that we've talked about before. Um, this uh, PowerPoint does have a link to a guide on Simplify 3D. We're kind of getting through a lot of these different er errors and knowing how to diagnose them. Uh, generally, though, there's a lot of very knowledgeable people downstairs. So if you're completely stumped on what could be wrong, you know. Anybody with a red name tag, 
who's a facilitator or anybody else hanging around the 3D printer is not going to help you out. So, other types of errors. Now, these are kind of some colloquial names that are used to describe different things. Um, you know, stringing or little hairs when they're all hanging off of that. Um, just poor settings. <laughs> Spaghetti, which I've seen a couple times where it just didn't adhere. So the printer's printing, but it's just like shooting the plastic everywhere. It just creates this giant mess. It's not fun. Um, a blob, thankfully I've never seen a blob, but it's where it's only sticking to the print head and nothing else. So it's just shooting plastic into a bigger and bigger bubble. That's pretty scary. Um, and then of course, layer shifts that can be, like I said before, uh, down to just errors in the G code, also issues with actual supply voltages to the motors, or there could be belt slipping, any number of things causing the print head to not be where the system thinks it should be. Um, a lot of other problems, like so for real serious stuff, especially things like jams or clogs, a facilitator is going to be the best person to help you um, because, you know, we at least know a little bit more about the machines, have some more familiarity with them. Some of us more than others, you know, if Colin's around, I feel like Colin is kind of low key, the major expert guy. There are a few who have done more printing, I think. There are there are a lot of people. I mean, I always notice Colin's always the one answering questions. It seems Colin Colin runs the print department. Yeah, that would explain a lot of experience dealing with dealing with three D printing issues. Yes, but also the three D printing Slack is also a great place if you're having questions or issues about prints you're doing. Um, you can see some of the sort of difficult difficulties you can have. Um, Z height offset being wrong, where because uh, basically, ideally, when the 3D printer is printing, um, you can see when it's too high, it shouldn't be like putting toothpaste on a toothbrush where it's just like lobbing it on there and just kind of saying, well, deal with it. Uh, but it also shouldn't be too low or like the tip is scraping along that each layer. It should be like just that Goldilocks perfect height where it's like lobbing it out, kind of flattening it, just making sure it's pushed it just enough to the actual layer below. Um, different materials also need different temperatures and settings. There are a ton of different 3D printing materials. The Prusas handle PLA well. Um, I think I've seen some people play around with flexible materials, but I do know that people have printed PETG down there pretty successfully. PETG is type of polyester resin. Um, it's a little bit stronger than PLA. Uh, they usually come, they come in clear colors too, which is pretty sweet. So that's also a great option for downstairs. And another thing, messy beds. Messy beds sink ships. I want to think of a good rhyme there, but I don't have one. Um, but a messy bed is going to be a big problem. So like I said before, uh, we use acoustics. I'm worried about adhesion. Uh, like I've done some like larger prints on machines. I would like to put just a layer of acoustic. There's always acoustic hanging around the 3D printers. Simple layer, just wipe it on real quick so you know the model's going. It leaves a little bit of PVA glue that is sensitive to the heat of the filament and it allows it to more easily bind to the print bed and make sure that your model stays in place. It will leave a residue, but realize all you have to do is bring it over to the slop sink, turn on hot water, leave it there for a little bit, wipe it clean, dry it off. It's like it never happened. Uh, always do that. Always make sure it's clean if it looks a little filthy. Just go ahead and wipe it down before you print, just to keep it nice and fresh. Um, also, sometimes the printers beep. They beep when they're mad. They also beep when they're done. Uh, so it's kind of a confusing alarm system. <laughs> Be nice if they had different things for different issues. But, you know, you see a beep, peer over, oh, something might be going on. You know, uh, uh, case with me, um, I was printing something and Darcy happened to catch a weird noise. He's able to fix the print before anything bad happens, save the whole print. So, you know, keep your ears out. If something sounds like weird is going on, just take a look, pause, pause the print at least. It looks like something's wrong. You could be helping somebody out. There are many different types of printers, like I mentioned before. Um, the different printers we have here, we do have a Formlabs resin printer and a Mark Forge FDM printer, which uses nylon infused carbon fiber. So 
uh, form labs, uh, we have three grades of uh, resin. It's just kind of like regular white, strong, and then high temp. Um, and they have all different properties. Uh, again, the form lab is really good at that fine detail work. You may have seen people here in the space using it for miniature work and stuff like that. It is beautiful for that kind of work. Um, again, we also have the washing and curing equipment for the form labs as well. So realize when you print something on a form labs, it doesn't pop out done. You've got to put it in the washing system, then you have to put it in the curing system to finish the print. So it takes a little bit of extra time to finish your prints. The Mark Forge, again, uses nylon infused carbon fiber. So it's also extra, extra sensitive to humidity. So you probably noticed if you've seen that printer downstairs, it's filament is stored in a special dry box, so desiccant. Um, but the prints it makes are incredibly strong because of the reinforcement. And it does also print a little bit better than the other FTM printers downstairs. I feel like it has a little bit of a finer uh, layer height, so uh, it tends to come out a lot smoother. Um, and the Mark Forge would be great if you're doing anything that requires a lot of heavy functional use. Um, it is also more expensive because of that. Now, make KD printer etiquette. Also, actually, just a side note for other types of 3D printers, there are other cool things you can do. Um, a lot of other services you can mail away for. They allow you to print in metal, like aluminum or steel, um, all kinds of different stuff. You can even get stuff printed in gold. I don't know why you would do that. It's too expensive. Even like a small little thing like this, like two thousand dollars. I'm like, okay. Um, anyway, make even printer etiquette. You can get it printed in platinum too. I like, I even just like mouse over, it, just like, okay, how much did this bracket cost? Like, oh, five thousand dollars. Cool. But make even printer etiquette. Um, you can remove a finished print, like if it's been sitting there, it's not working anymore. Nobody's come to get it. A little bit. Go ahead, carefully remove it from the print bed. Place it on the finished print shelf, which is just behind the 3D printers. Don't remove the support material. Obviously, if in the process of peeling it off, some of the support material material cracks off, it's gonna happen, it's supposed to. But don't remove the support material. Let someone, let the person who's printed is do that. That's just kind of general 3D printer etiquette. Um, check to make sure you're not printing with somebody else's filament. Again. Bay Caven pretty much has kind of some bog standard colors, basic color stuff. If you see something really wild or crazy, chances are it's somebody's special filament. So just double check. I know sometimes people will leave behind like little chunks of old filament if it's not enough for them to hang on to, but you know, always check. Um, make sure you slack as well. So like, you know, again, if you, for instance, remove somebody's print, pop in on the 3D printing channel, oh, hey, I, Take a picture of it or move this, put it on the shelf, FYI, to see what print it is. Let people know. Same thing with asking about filament, same thing about asking for any damage or issues or printing concerns that you can't figure out yourself. Always put it through on Slack. Uh, the red X, if you see that magnetic red X anywhere on the printer, usually means it's out of service. Um, I think technically they were supposed to be like don't use and done, but they've just kind of become the marker, the red X, because there was also the green check. There but is, yeah. I don't know Even why you put the green check. Originally, but, <laughs> but yeah, so the, there's a red, if the red X is on there, it's come to mean that like printers out of service. Usually when somebody pops the red X on there, they message someone that, oh, Octoprint one is like not printing or not extruding or something like that. Um, you can let somebody know, or if you don't know what the issue is, you just know it's not working. Put the X on there so other people know that something's wrong, and then make sure Slack is messaged. Uh, even putting a post it note if there's something specific it's doing that seems weird, just also kind of lets the next person know or lets the next facilitator know, oh, okay, let me try to investigate this. Um, it says don't use the glue stick on Prusa, only on the Mark Forge. It seems to be a point of controversy. Yeah, I use it a little bit, especially with larger prints. Again, it washes right off, and it's just that matter of, because I remember when I was badged, I was like, yeah, I use the glue if you need to for adhesion. So it's a very, I, sorry, I'm, I'm confused right now. I thought it was like, you were supposed to use the glue stick, but you're not supposed to use the glue stick. Again, that's like a controversial bullet point there, because it actually helps. Corey, who made the slideshow, was of the opinion that one should not use glue stick. It doesn't hurt to use glue stick. It's just because it's washable and it comes off. 
Yeah. That's the thing that I think that's maybe where Corey's getting at because the Bruce's have so, because the Mark Forge, it's required to use glue. It will not work if you don't use glue. Um, but the Prusas is optional. I mean, and I know I've worked with a lot of other 3D printer people who are like, oh yeah, just slap that glue stick on, like use it as much as you want because it does help with adhesion. The issue is like I was saying before, make sure you clean it. You know, I always clean before and after, you know, I know sometimes if you're busy, you just run off with your print or whatever, but I always try to make sure you need that uh, work panel nice and clean. Um, clean out the print bed. Um, so the next part sticks, just exactly what I said. Leave the place cleaner than you found it. You know, again, subjective analysis, but always make sure your printer's nice and clean. I always like to make sure when I'm done with the prints, I just take a peek at the print head, make sure no plastic or other gunk has gotten stuck there. Um, and just like, you know, maybe pick it off, use a wire brush to the cleaner or something, just to make sure the next person is gonna have an easy time printing. Um, so those are the basics. That's everything we covered. Um, we'll focus more on like, more of the concepting and 3D modeling aspects as things go forward. But for right now, that's kind of the basics of 3D printing and what goes into it. So, um, any questions here in the room? No, I think you got them out. Cool. Uh, same thing, actually, because you asked before about cost and knowing how much to pay. Uh, same thing with the Mark Forge. It tells you the meters that are used. Uh, there's a different meter rate for that material. And also for the form labs, there's a material cost by volume because it's a liquid that comes out and there's a make haven posted rate for that volumetric rate. Uh, anybody online have any questions? I know I don't see anybody. Hopefully everybody's been able to hear me. All right. So anything else? When are your app? Yeah, I'll be around. My hours are Wednesday, so it's last night. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I am around the badge on Wednesdays, six to nine. Um, yeah, uh, you can get badged on all the three printers all at once. Uh, I know a lot of facilitators don't like to do that, especially because, like, especially if you're new to three D printing, it might make sense start with the cruises, start with the basic stuff get comfortable with using them, then slowly upgrade to the more sophisticated printers. Uh, it's just a kind of easier way to do it, especially if you're new. If you have a specific thing that you know you need to do, you really want to make model figurines that are very small detailed, you want to start with one of the other printers, then by all means, but the proofs are the that FDM is kind It's your Mario and Mario Kart, if you will. The average. <laughs> Hard to mess up. Yeah. So I have a quick question about the filament, the filament itself. Mm -hmm. um, are there different thicknesses of PLA? Mm -hmm. And if so, what do we make sure that we get if we want to order something fancy like what Ashley's got with the multi Yes, um, filaments usually come in a pretty standard size. Uh, the specs for the Prusa are online in terms of what filament okay. that it accepts. The Prusas are all 1.75 millimeter filament, okay. and that's by far the most common when you go look for the PLA filament. That's what you will probably find. Um, but yes. And that's, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for, again, like, Make even stocks, basic colors, but actually, if you notice downstairs, Ashley is currently printing a rainbow shiny lamps oh, base. I knew it was hers oh, because of the filament. The person who um who's into 3D printing, I think they, they posted like your files. And yeah, 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 yeah. Chat, yeah. So she said she'd do that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like everybody's all set online. Bye. Goodbye. See you later, everybody.